especially subject matter expertise type, and especially in the areas of standardization, in the areas of development, and, uh, and in complementary to the, to the work that is being done by such organizations like development banks. And we have a couple of representatives of them, uh, of these organizations here in the panel. So in terms of our collaborations, and that's the t topic of today's, so we have, so one of our most important collaborative partnerships is ITU Impact, or International Multilateral Partnership Against Cyber Threats. That includes 146 uh, countries joined together to tackle this uh, global issue. And uh, uh, part of the work includes global response center that allows those countries to respond to the threats, and, but also parts of that allows to build capacity and uh, exchange information. And also ITU Impact has a cooperation agreement with Interpol that allows, again, cooperation between, uh, between cybersecurity authorities and telecom authorities and also the police authorities in that regard. Part of this work is also working on establishing um, computer incident response teams and helping the countries on that. We have already been, have been working with 42 countries in that regard and established a few successful uh, successful uh, uh, CRTs in some of the countries. Uh, if you also, part of uh, that work also includes regional centers, and we have a, a T Impact has an Arab Regional Cybersecurity um, and Innovation Center in Oman, covering 22 countries in the Arab region. And in this year, July, we signed a memorandum of understanding with Nigerian Communications Commission to establish a regional cybersecurity center in, the, in Africa as well. Also, we work with the various uh, with various private sector companies like Symantec, Kaspersky Labs, IC2, IBI Research, Trend Micro, both in exchange information and collaborative partnerships. The part, big part of that work is also capacity building. For example, cyber cyber drills were conducted in a few countries individually, and also this year, August, just a couple of months ago, we had a regional cyber drill in the Latin America region, Montevideo. Next week, we'll have a cyber drill for Arab region in Oman. So it also allows countries to build resilience and build capabilities to respond to the threats. Uh, so capacity building also includes our workshops. In July in Durban, we had a workshop for 20, 20 countries in the African region. Um, as well, ITU Impact Training and Skills Development Center trained 2,700 cybersecurity professionals, uh, gave, given 330 scholarships, to over 49 uh, member states. And we now started implementing another project for specifically for all the Cs uh, to help their cybersecurity. And again, recently, just a few weeks ago, we had, together with Internet Society and CTEL, we had a workshop on spam in uh, Mendoza, Argentina for the Latin America. So some of the UN partnerships, and that's again coming back now, so all cooperations with the UN. So we have a very close cooperating relationship with the UNODC, or United Nations Office for Drugs and Crime. So basically, specifically working on building capacity on cybercrime issues. We worked with the European Commission on the project, on the so-called ICP project, so helping Sub-Saharan Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific Islands to harmonize cybersecurity and cybercrime legislations. We worked with the World Bank, our colleagues here, and assisting, and we now are working in Bhutan to assisting the, on building the third team in Bhutan. And what's also the very good example of collaboration among many partners in this panel is in this early December, and the minister announced in the, open, in the high level leaders meeting in Azerbaijan will be a global cybersecurity cooperation. Uh, conference, which is collaboration within ITU, World Bank, World Economic Forum, so at least quite a few partners here on the panel, and already a good example of another collaboration, and in Paul. Another, uh, just a last aspect which I'll very briefly touch, and this I think is a very good development, recent development, is UN-wide framework on cybersecurity and cybercrime, which was just last week um, endorsed by so-called high-level committee and programs, which is UN body, and basically combining many, many UN agencies. And that was collaborative effort between 33 UN agencies, development banks, and we very grateful for World Bank for their uh, very good collaboration in that and good support. And David personally was very closely involved in that work. And this framework actually, the main purpose of that framework is to, uh, to agree on the principal level how UN agencies, development banks will help developing countries uh, to support uh, in the support, 
by how they will make sure that everyone is working within their mandates, but at the same time, holistic support is provided and holistic assistance is provided so with, to all the countries, uh, and that they can get support both on cybercrime, but also other cybersecurity issues, uh, that uh, human rights are respected, uh, that also the, the support is provided having regard to the whole government approach, so it's not a piecemeal approach, but the integrated programming, and every agency and development bank can contribute from their own perspective, adding to the, adding, uh, to the capacities of the countries. Another development that will stem from that, and that's just the last point, will be compendium on mandate of different UN agencies in cybersecurity and cybercrime, which is now being developed and will be soon public. So that is something that again will allow countries not only to very clearly identify which UN agency or development bank is best placed to help them and also then will allow UN agencies and the development banks to, to see who are the best partners for them when uh, responding in country assistance. So I think there's a lot of good work is being done and happy to share that today. But I think it's uh, thank you very much also for the World Bank and uh, IADB and the uh, Korean government to kind of putting together this panel as well, which I think is also one more step forward in that work. Thanks very much, David. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, Mr. Chan, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you, World Bank, for inviting me to this very important event. I'm glad that I could say about OECD, not Korean government. Uh, working party on information security and privacy, and how the WPISP made contributions on uh, capacity building. My name is Tai Chong. I'm a uh, teaching computer science at Songgyungwan University, it's one of the largest uh, universities in Korea. Then I uh, served as uh, vice chair of the OECD working party on uh, information security and privacy for the last seven years. Also, I was the chair of advisory committee Thank you. Advisory Committee for Seoul uh, Conference on Cyberspace 2013, which was successfully ended last week in Korea. Then you know the acronym of OECD. OECD stands for Organization for um, Economic Cooperation and Development. And let me ask one more thing. What is mission statement to OECD? You probably don't know. The, uh, it is Better Policies for Better Lives. It well defines the goal of OECD. Then I just please just keep in mind that policy is our tool to help the uh, developing countries for capacity building, not money. Uh, to achieve the goal, we uh, in normally takes three steps. The first one is measures, compares, and analyzes data to understand economic and social changes. Second step is on the basis of this analysis, it then develops consensus-based policy recommendations among the. Uh, the membership, membership uh, countries. Third step is then it promotes policies to improve the economic and social well-being of uh, people around the world. Here, let me tell you a little more about the OECD. OECD is an in, you know, uh, governmental organization and works for governments. It provides uh, an international forum where 34 con uh, uh, member countries discuss the uh, problems and issues that they face and try to find the common solutions to common challenges. OECD members span the globe from North and South America to Europe and the Asia Pacific region. They include many of the world's most advanced countries, both those emerging countries like Mexico, Chile, and, and Turkey. Among other international organizations, the OECD is quite special in a few aspects. The first one is that it focuses on economic cooperation and development. OECD addresses hundreds of different areas which have an impact on economic and social progress, tax trade competition, employment and social progress, tax, uh, the, 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 and also education, agriculture, chemical, energy, anti-bribery, and uh, security and privacy, and so on. And then secondly, OECD focuses on the policy level the main business is not to negotiate conventions and treaties or carry out uh, on-site activities. It is to help government understand the environment and how to address economic and social challenges. OECD does a lot of uh, statistics and policy analysis. So journalists sometimes call the OECD a think tank, but it's more than a think tank. 
The OECD Council adopts recommendations which reflect a consensus across our membership about uh, what policies work best. Uh, they are non-binding, but members commit to do their utmost to full, uh, fully implement them. Thus, the more prepared to call OECD a policy standard setter. The thirdly, OECD is not just intergovernmental. Since its creation 52 years ago, the OECD listens to the voice from the business sector. In the policy area of the digital economy, all non-governmental stakeholders participate in the discussions, business, civil society, the internet technical community, and trade unions. OECD has been interested in cybersecurity since the 1970s when OECD members realized that the emergence of ICT had a significant impact on economic development. And in that context, a trust came up as a key concept because they thought that trust is the essential for ICTs to fully realize their economics and social contributions to the economy. In fact, there are many dimensions to trust, but privacy and security emerged as the main ones for policy making. From then on, working party on information security and privacy, WISP has made contributions over decades. decades. Uh, here is contributions made on privacy. The 1980 privacy guidelines established an international framework to foster uh, consistent privacy frameworks. It has insp uh, inspired most privacy legislations in the world. The privacy guidelines were revised for the first time since 1980 this year. Here is another contribution made on security. In 1992, the OECD Council adopted guidelines for the security of information systems, which is a set of principles for approaching IT security at policy level and recommendations for government in developing public or, or policies. In 2012, OECD published a, a comparative analysis of 10 volunteer country cybersecurity strategies. The report provides a brief overview of intergovernmental bodies and initiatives currently addressing cybersecurity and the policy level, uh, including APEC, the Council of Europe, EU, G8, IGF, NATO, uh, OECD, OSCE, OAS, UN, uh, as well as the Conference of Cyberspace and uh, Meridian Process. The security guidelines were revised in 2002 to take into account the emergency of the internet. Today, they are on the review process now and give us an opportunity for OECD to work with other international organizations interested in cybersecurity policy. We have organized a security expert group for the review of the guidelines which is open to participation from international, intergovernmental, and multilateral organizations, not only the member countries. Now, I uh, briefly tell you how OECD has made contributions to cybersecurity for development. First, policies are designed not only for the membership countries, but also for devel developing countries. The secondly, the OECD approach to cybersecurity is in risk management basis. So developing countries could take this OECD approach to minimize the uh, damages from trial and error. The third contribution by OECD is that government aren't the only stakeholders. For the OECD, a multi-stakeholder approach is essential, so is public and private cooperation. Lastly, during the current review of OECD 2002 security guidelines, we realized the, uh, the importance of developing cybersecurity capacity internationally, particularly for de developing countries. Uh, as far as I know, WISP does not directly help developing countries as much as other organizations like World Bank and IDB. But OECD has been helping them with policies and experiences from trial and errors. I believe they may be more important than uh, the policies may be more important than anything else, and OECD will continuously try to help the uh, developing countries in the same way. I see that today the IDB, World Bank, ITU, and OECD could be a, big, a good, a perfect combination in supporting developing countries. Then financially, IDB and World Bank, then technically by the ITU, and the policy could be provided the OECD. Then uh, these four organizations could help 
the, uh, the uh, perfectly the uh, developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chung, uh, a very thorough overview of the important work that OECD has historically been doing in this area. Antonio, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to start by thank you, the, I mean, saying thank you to the, to the World Bank by the organization of this important event and the opportunity of just bringing to the same table the different organization. And uh, then immediately, just for those of you who doesn't know who is the IDB, the IDB is a development bank that is basically focused in the Latin America and the Caribbean regions. We are uh, supporting 26 countries uh, in that particular region in areas related to uh, you know, uh, different type of, uh, of sectors, not only telecommunications, but uh, you know, civil, civil work, uh, security, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what are we doing uh, precisely when we are going to the, to the topic of cybersecurity? Uh, the IDB recently approved a broadband initiative. The board of directors uh, last, last month of March approve a broadband initiative, a broadband special program that basically intends to uh, be supporting the countries in four major areas of intervention. First one is related to uh, uh, development of national broadband plans and governance models. Second is uh, support the countries in terms of strategic regulations. Third one is uh, basically infrastructure. Uh, and the fourth one is capacity building. Uh, precisely under the umbrella of this broadband initiative, I would like to highlight two particular projects that are going to uh, somehow lead to a specific collaboration uh, between uh, the IDB and some of the organizations that are precisely in this table. One project is precisely the development of a, a training center, a broadband training center, that is going to have like a list of different modules, different courses. Uh, one of them will be precisely cybersecurity for uh, supporting the different officials and governments in the Central America and the Caribbean on this particular matter as well as those related to, uh, to broadband. And then the second one is a project that is going to be launched uh, in, the, I mean, in 2014, which is precisely related to uh, cybersecurity. So when we talk about cybersecurity in the 26 countries from Latin America, uh, the Latin American, Latin American region, we realize that no more than two, three are having a clear strategy on cybersecurity. So there is a great opportunity of helping the countries in the, develop, in the development of uh, particular cybersecurity strategies, but also in, the, uh, in, in sharing uh, particular experiences coming from some other parts around the world, uh, with whom we are working currently. At the moment, I would like to highlight three major institutions with which with, with, uh, the, the IDB is currently working. The ITU, precisely with them, we are working in two important projects. One is going to be the creation of this uh, broadband training center for, for the, I, for the uh, Central American region and the Caribbean. Uh, then also, uh, we are working with them uh, and supporting them in the, in the broadband commission, where this particular topic of cybersecurity at some moment in time is going to be part of it. Uh, then with the OECD, we are going to be working on the development of a toolkit just to promote the uh, uh, user's adoption and of, of broadband services. And again, the cybersecurity is going to be a, a, a part of it. And then the government of Korea. The government of Korea is one of our major supporters. And we are uh, uh, basically working together in all of those activities that I was, I was, I was mentioning. Just to come up with, with a proposal on, on top of the table. Uh, I think that having this type of discussions is, 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 is simply perfect. The problem is that frequently, uh, or not frequently, but uh, let's say that uh, recently we are not really uh, sitting all of us together in a friendly and open way uh, and discuss about important issues. Uh, the proposal basically consists on creating a community of practice on this particular matter, uh, taking into account which are like uh, the situation of leading countries, like for instance, Korea, the Americans, Israel, or even the European Commission, uh, and then just try to identify which is the uh, existing uh, gap between uh, regions like, for instance, the, the region where I am working, the Latin America, but also some other regions, and come up with uh, you know, some recommendations that could be discussed uh, in a particular uh, workshops or, 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 or let's say, uh, 
uh, working tables uh, among different practitioners. So that uh, the experience uh, that the World Bank is having, the, the extensive experience that the World Bank is having on this particular matter could be shared, or, or at, that some, at some moment in time, the experience coming from the, the government of Korea or the ITU or, or some other institution, as well as the IDB, could be put together and uh, we really uh, try to make the region move ahead. So all in all, I would like to just to summarize everything uh, in just one sentence. I think that we have a commitment with our people. I mean, we are development banks, we are institutions that somehow are looking for the good of the people, are, are trying to look for making the life of the, of the, of the people uh, better in our different regions. And we cannot, uh, we somehow have to uh, move on from what, it, what we can, we can call us like a NATO, no action stock only, to a, a situation or to a, 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 let's say, a statement that can be summarized in three major components. Actions, collaborations, and development. So we have a, a great challenge uh, among us just to coordinate and, uh, and see how we can eventually support our countries. Thank you very much, Herman. Antonio, thank you very much. I'm sure we'd like to discuss further with you the uh, community of practice that you're proposing. Uh, Alan. Okay, um, so Alan Marcus, uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, for those that don't know the World Economic Forum, we are essentially an international institution. We are a multi-stakeholder, nonpartisan platform focused on collaboration and improving the state of the world, which are all very big words. But uh, our focus really is looking at how to bring various stakeholders together around uh, clear global issues. One of them certainly is, is cybersecurity. A few years ago, we uh, went and surveyed a whole bunch of leaders, CEOs of multinational corporations around the world, government leaders, at heads of state, heads of government, and, and other significant ministers, and we asked them, what was their strategy for building a safe cyber system? Um, and who was responsible for that within their organizations? I'd say somewhere in the 90 to 95% range, those leaders could not answer this question. They had no idea who was responsible for securing their cyber assets. In fact, they didn't even understand, and in fact, we even heard here uh, yesterday that a lot of people don't even have the same definition for cybersecurity and what it represents. So we embarked on a uh, program, on a uh, commitment to bringing together these leaders around something we're calling partnering for cyber resilience. Now, we particularly call it resilience because the notion of security kept invoking the idea of building walls and ensuring that people can't come in. And in fact, we know that that's not only not practical, um, it's, it's certainly not pragmatic. Resilience is more focused on how do you build a model that says if attacks occur, they're not catastrophic. How do we work together more as communities? How do we work together in a public-private uh, cooperation? So with that, we uh, built something we started with around uh, the notion of awareness of these issues. How do we get these leaders to start thinking beyond the fact that they point to some random person and say that that's the person responsible for this and recognize that they themselves in the leadership position have a role and a responsibility for protecting these assets. So we built this uh, program moving people from awareness uh, to understanding to action and specifically the uh, principles that then became part of this uh, activity were four very simple things and we have over 110 organizations now signed up uh, for these four principles, 16 different business sectors, 23 countries, uh, including uh, the ITU, uh, OAS, um, and uh, the European Commission and, and others. Um, and the four basic principles are simply this. First, by signing, and literally pen on paper, they sign this um, recognition of interdependence. That is, you cannot solve these problems alone. And if you keep trying to, um, you, you will fail. So recognition of interdependence, everyone has a role in, in making this work. The second is the role of leadership. If you're the CEO, if you're the head of government, head of state, you're a significant senior uh, member of a party, 
then you have a responsibility to be aware of these issues and to work this into an overall risk uh, framework. Uh, three, that this is something that needs to be part of an ongoing plan, a risk management plan, develop practical and effective a program to combat it. And four, and this I think is the most important part if we're going to continue with the notion of awareness, is you have to promote it. So we have leaders now running around the world building um, sort of various uh, fora to ensure that this awareness is happening. One coming up in the next few weeks is, in, as an example, is in uh, Amsterdam, the Grand Conference. And during that conference, one of the uh, sessions will actually be focused on more people signing up uh, to, this, uh, to this commitment. Two years ago, we went back out and we interviewed a whole bunch of leaders again. And what we found was now they could tell us that there was somebody responsible within their organization. And the second question then we asked was, how often do you meet them? And that became another challenge. And I'd say, again, in the 90-something percent range, they kind of knew the name of the person now. They knew there was somebody, but they didn't really meet them often and didn't understand, again, so their role and responsibility. So now we've been focusing on how do we build this into an action plan. And we brought together uh, a diverse range of these leaders. And we've created a set of priorities that they need to focus on, one, information sharing so that they can better understand what the, the issues are um, and where there are laws in the way. How do we work together with policymakers to take down those places or to create safe harbor uh, for communication? Um, focusing on what is really critical infrastructure. You know, if you're a business leader, you think everything is, but it kind of as a community um, with your government, there may be very specific definitions, so what are they? And then what is the process we want to use together uh, to foster a better policy development? And recommendation actually came out of this to really frame this from our standpoint as an economic issue. Everybody else focuses this as a technical issue or a policy issue, and we want to continue to, to make sure that happens. But adding this economic issue definitely changes the game uh, quite a bit. So in the last year, we went out and again, we interviewed lots of leaders. And it was quite fascinating to watch how this awareness plan worked because now not only are we hearing that they know exactly who is responsible, but that, in fact, uh, they can tell you the name and they can tell you the last time they met with them. So I think this is a, a huge uh, step forward for leaders taking a role in responsibility. Uh, and so now what we're putting together is a unified agenda which focuses on contextualizing the recommendations by these leaders and providing an ongoing sustained platform for collective uh, discovery. And we're building now the straw man for the economic model that frames uh, these issues. So certainly the more we can get involved with this, uh, the better this is going to be. But in parallel to some of the other activities we're hearing collectively, I think we're at least making progress. Thank you. Alan, thank you very much. Um, I think we'd be very interested in following up with you on the economic modeling around cybersecurity. That's an issue that is important to us and will lead us directly into our final panelist this morning, Chris Vane from the World Bank. Chris? Thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Vian. I head up the global ICT uh, practice at the World Bank, and it's a pleasure to be here, um, seeing some, some, some familiar faces, meeting some new ones, and also um, thank you to the panelists uh, on the panel for agreeing to come this morning and be a part of this, uh, this discussion. For those of you uh, who may not know exactly what the World Bank is, uh, I'd like to spend just a minute or so uh, describing uh, what we do. Uh, we have a, a new -er president, newish president. He's been about uh, in the office for about a year. And he has earlier this year focused the World Bank on two prime goals. The first goal is solving extreme poverty in the world, and that means those people, as we define it, living on $1.25 a day or less. And second, to raise economic prosperity for the bottom 40% of all developing countries in the world. It's a hugely ambitious goal, and one that cannot be accomplished, quite frankly, without the transformative power of technology, including information and communication technologies, as core to our strategy. Um, we are, first and foremost, a bank, a financier. And I would say over the last 10 years, we have probably financed about $4 billion worth of projects, ICT, you know, relative to ICT, around the world, 
in most uh, and just about every developing country and region in the world. We also are an, uh, a convener, an impatient convener oftentimes, for bringing together those in need and those who can provide advice, assistance, and support to the various projects that are being undertaken. And many of the organizations here at this table um, have made mention of the fact that we have worked together in and around the uh, areas of knowledge, and I'll get to um, cybersecurity in a minute. And last, uh, but certainly not least, we are uh, a neutral party in that when we work with our client countries, we do not pick sides, we do not choose technologies, we are there to help that particular country solve their particular needs using the available knowledge and expertise and products and services around the world. And that does tend to make us unique in, um, in many respects. About uh, three, four years ago, the World Bank created the ICT strategy, and um, cybersecurity was key, is key, very much in that strategy. And uh, we identified some key areas that we were, um, as a bank, to focus on. Uh, remember that <clears throat> because we are a financier and we have such a massive portfolio of loans, it is um, our duty and, and responsibility to ensure that cybersecurity is built into all of those loans and that we work um, diligently to ensure that cybersecurity is embedded into the results. But we, um, in that uh, strategy, talked about national cert development, talked about cyber laws and regulations, business continuity and backup centers, cloud and mobile security, capacity building and cybersecurity, and of course, national cybersecurity strategy and policy. So very specifically, um, we have about 125 projects within the bank now on this subject of cybersecurity. And um, for financing national certs, we have projects going on in Sri Lanka, Rwanda, Tunisia, Bangladesh, Nigeria, some of whom you will hear in the next session after this one. For cybersecurity policy and regulatory framework, we're working in Mongolia, Rwanda, and Sri Lanka. Look forward to hearing from Jay on that one. And uh, certainly not last but uh, not least, cybersecurity awareness and capacity building again in Sri Lanka and Rwanda. So to the point of collaboration, um, my colleagues uh, on this panel have done a very good job of talking about the various um, ways and means and tools that we are working on to, I think, really begin the process of working much more closely together in areas such as cybersecurity. So I won't repeat what they've been saying, but I will say that there, there appears to be almost this bottoms-up uh, approach or bottoms-up um, demand for us to work together. And most recently, well, actually several weeks ago, in the United States, I was with my uh, counterparts from the Gates Foundation, from part of the UN, from DFID, from a number of organizations, really talking about principles for ICT um, development and cybersecurity or security and privacy is, was included as one of the eight top principles that we should all be focusing on as well as the principle of openness. And so I think while we are doing these uh, very important and major um, principles and agreements, I think our own um, grantees and even some of the organizations who you don't normally think of are coming together demanding that we work together and are suggesting and we are indeed talking about ways to build that input into creating new and very interesting um, tools to ensure that we are working much more closely together. Thanks, David. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have a few minutes for questions before we move to our next sub-session. Um, let me first go to the remote moderators. Any questions from remote participants? Okay. Um, questions from the floor, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to go back to some points that Alan mentioned. I think that you framed 
the debate very well. You talked about uh, resilience, not uh, security, so we don't have wall gardens. Um, you talked about the importance of recognizing interdependence between actors, and this is a key point as well. Um, but uh, for that to happen, it uh, depends on trust being in place among actors, and so they are open to collaboration. And due to recent events, as have been framed uh, here in the IGF, this trust has been seriously undermined, not only among governments, but between governments and companies, not only hardware companies, but also platforms, um, between civil society and governments, and between civil society and companies. Um, so I'd like to ask you if you have somewhat adjusted your strategy to this new environment, and how would you adjust your strategy to foster trust? Um, and uh, would you say that after these events, the cybersecurity issues will increasingly be seen as national security issues, and how this would impact accountability and transparency of discussions regarding cybersecurity and multi-stakeholder participation, of course. Okay, that's a very big question. Um, so uh, let me just say this, trust is paramount. It, it's kind of that simple. Um, now, what does trust mean? And uh, my definition, I, you know, for those who have small kids, we learn so much from them. I have a five-year-old son, and when I get close to him, he starts to get very guarded, and I say, what, what's the matter? I, I don't trust you, he tells me. What, what, what do you mean you don't trust me? You're, I don't trust that you're not going to tickle me. And I say, but I'm not going to tickle you. I don't trust you, because of course I am. And he loves it, and he laughs. But what is he telling me? He's telling me very simple, trust is you do what you say. Right? And so what happened in some of the recent events, unfortunately, is something happened that is not what they said they were doing. And, and I think that's, that's the trust challenge. Now, with that said, trust is paramount. We, we can't do this without trust, um, and we have to make it work with, with trust. We, we can't let some unfortunate events hold us back, because if we do, we're not going to get there. The, the Internet and the related ICT technologies have created unprecedented growth. Um, there's uh, new economic uh, powers that are coming online, uh, poverty that's been erased. I mean, things that are just incomprehensible a few years ago are changing rapidly. We cannot allow a few bad actors or a few uh, trust mistakes to, to hold us back. So from a strategy standpoint, we're, we're not changing in that respect. We need the world to see an open, safe, and usable uh, set of digital uh, opportunities, and the internet is, is certainly core to that. So I, I don't see the strategy changing. I think the more people work together, the, the better. Uh, the, the simple uh, metaphor we've been using is, is washing your hands. You know, we all know if we wash our hands, we can prevent a lot of communicable disease. It's a real simple act. Each of us do it personally. We don't have to collectively teach each other how to wash our hands, we just do it individually. And if all of us don't do it, it's still okay because if enough do it, we have slowed down the spread of certain diseases. The same thing has to happen here. We have to understand what those simple tools are, right, and a lot of people are working on them and making it easier to be available, uh, particularly for areas that may not quite have the economic uh, posture to, to do it. And we can stop a lot of, a lot of the challenges and continue to, to build trust. It's, it's a risk-reward situation. Yeah, very briefly, Thomas. Just, <clears throat> just adding from our perspective, and I think from our perspective, it's important to sometimes separate the global discussion about the trust among big actors that, that has been happening and about the discussion at the country level. At least of our experience, we've been seeing that, for example, multi-stakeholder collaborations on the country level were very, very efficient, very effective, and in my experience, and they... The people come together, they work for the same reason. They, on the country level, the roles are usually much clearer defined and they find the solutions. And that's where I think it's important, and especially when we speak about the assistance now to the countries, that I think is important to separate. I think for ITU then, what is important also for us, that for nearly now 150 years, we've been a neutral organization that's built trust to many member states and especially the member states that need assistance. So I think in this type of environment, what we still what we very, very value and very, very safeguard is that fact, that we're a neutral organization, that our standardizations, standardization practices are totally neutral and membership-driven. That means everyone can come and everyone can contribute, and everyone can, if you will, check each other. At the same time that uh, our development work is being done with the country 
you know, with the countries that uh, trusted us for many years. At the same time, with the, uh, with the civil society that's being involved in those countries. And again, from my own experience, we've been working very well with civil society on various, you know, in various projects on the ground. Like I mentioned, the recent example with our internet, uh, our project on the spam with the Internet Society and ITU in Latin America. So I think it's just. I think one, as, as is some science uh, say, I think in this development workers just need to keep calm and keep going and doing that work that World Economic Forum is doing, and at the same time looking how to resolve these big issues, big picture issues that you know a lot of being discussed here. Thanks. Okay, with that, um, we'll close this part of the session. If I could ask the panelists who are here now to please quickly vacate their seats and for the next group to come up. In the next session, we'll be testing the hypothesis that were put on the table by the different multilateral organizations today. And we'll hear firsthand from the countries, uh, their experience in dealing with all of us. And I'm sure that'll generate a lot, generate a lot of discussion. Um, while they're getting set up, I'll briefly introduce um, our speakers. Um, we have uh, Moez from Tunisia. We have Jay from Sri Lanka. We have Zaur from Azerbaijan, and Izumi, uh, who will be following up at the end of the panel. We also had a, uh, a regret from uh, one of our panelists, uh, Sharif Hashem from Egypt. So I'll be standing in for Sharif and giving a, a one-minute overview of what he would have presented. Uh, without further ado, I will turn over to our first panelist, Moaz. Thank you, David. I would like to thank the World Bank for this great opportunity. It's very important to deal with those subjects and with how we can uh, look forward and develop the cyber security and how to make this our cyberspace in the developing world more, much more safe. We all know that we developing countries have been very active recently to develop a cyber security strategy, national strategy. But uh, first of all, I would like um, to highlight that this national uh, uh, cybersecurity strategy would be very, we, 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 we need to be much more critical about it because how, what, what is the real situation in our developing world? We deal about cybersecurity, we talk about it, we meet a lot of people, we try to help and to try to make things better. But, but in reality, in the, in the, in the, in the field, there's a lot of mistakes. There is a lot of risk, there's a lot of threats, and the people are dealing with those threats differently. We can, in my country, for example, I can talk about my country, we have an, uh, a national agency that is in charge of cybersecurity. We have the ITI that I'm running for. ITI was involved with different actions related to cybersecurity and cybercrime investigation, but uh, there is never have been very clear about it. It's something that is not transparent. So today we, after, of course, after the revolution, it is something that we are really dealing with because we need to develop and we need to reconsider all what we have done during, uh, for many years in cybersecurity and in cybercrime, to combat cybercrime. Uh, when we highlight the, the reasons for, to, uh, to make the cybersecurity in our countries, we we really think about how to invest and how to develop the system, how to develop techniques beyond that. But at the same time, we forgot something very important that is also we need to develop our cyberspace. The cyberspace in our country is not the same as the cyberspace in the US or in Europe. So if you're dealing with cybersecurity and we don't have the same, the same cyberspace, we are mistaken something. We spend a lot of money in securing things, but we didn't spend a lot of money in developing things. So I think this is have to be considered very carefully when we, as as we are developing countries. And uh, the second I, I want to highlight also is human rights. When we deal with cybersecurity, we forgot about safeguarding some some, some of our principles and some of our uh, of uh, human rights, essential human rights like privacy, like freedom of expression. And we know very well the situation in our country, especially in my country before the revolution, and what how it was really a big challenge actually to, to move forward. So cybersecurity in a, an international field of view 
could be, it needs to be safeguarded. And those safeguards come not just from national laws. If you look to my country, for example, we have in the Constitution a lot of safeguards in terms of privacy. But we know very well, especially my, my, the company I'm running for today, violated all those principles for technical reasons, to prevent some attacks or whatever we want, but we were really, really active on this, in, in these approaches. So it is very important today to reconsider the strategy, how to implement the national the cybersecurity national strategy. Uh, and those issues are really important. We cannot really uh, be effective if we could make the cybersecurity strategy and, and you could implement the cybersecurity strategy and, and at the same time being like an enemy from our society because we are protecting the cyberspace and we are protecting the users of the internet at the same time. So uh, this is real challenges for us and uh, I will try to, to, to just finish by, my, my, my com by commenting something that we need today to collaborate. And I'm really welcoming a lot of a partnership in this field. We, I, I, I listened very carefully to the previous panel and say, this is the way we need to do. We are a developing country, and I think without cooperation today, we are not able to guarantee a minimum of cyberspace security. So today I think the cooperation is essential and I think we need to deal it with it carefully and as well as we consider all our human rights principles. So uh, by this I think I can maybe give the floor to Mr. Yanta Fernando or uh, Mr. Zaur Hazanov. Hazanov, that's it? Yeah, director of TASIM project from the Ministry of ICT and Azerbaijan. So he may, might be also important to highlight how Azerbaijan have dealt with the cyberspace and cyberspace security, and uh, it is very important to, so welcome. Works. Hi everyone, my name is Zaur Hassanov once again, and I'm happy to be here. I wanna thank World Bank for invitation. Honestly, when I received this email from Natalie, and I saw the questions, I was very happy because I waited for a long time to someone ask me this question. <laughs> so it, uh, in this regard, uh, TASIM project, I think that it's a great example of collaboration and how the project which started from small idea started to transfer and become um, very rich in terms of ideas who were put together and it's really reshaped the entire project. So, <coughs> sorry, TASIM, it's a terrestrial project, it's a terrestrial cable which going aiming to connect uh, Asia with uh, uh, Europe, precisely Frankfurt with uh, uh, Shanghai. And idea, well, you may ask why Azerbaijan has come with this idea. Why uh, uh, ICT is priority for Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, oil and gas rich country, we have abundant resources, we export more oil per day than Indonesia, as example. And, uh, but the, the pretext is that Azerbaijan always tried to leverage from its geography. If you look back when Azerbaijan became independent in 1991, it was a country on the brink of civil war. We had a war with Armenia. It was, it was a complete mess. Three years later, we decided to sign a this contract of century with Western oil companies. We decided to build Baku Jehan pipeline, which changed the landscape of the entire region. Then we built Baku Supsa, then we built we're building now Bakia Halkalaki Railroad. So why I'm giving all those examples to give the small country which perfectly understood what is its uh, place in this region and how it can contribute from it because of its uh, resources, because of its geography. So that's why back in 2008 or 2009, my minister, Ali Abbasov, uh, uh, come with this idea of TASIM to connecting in a terrestrial way the countries of uh, West and East. Uh, let's look at my notes. Uh, it's, it's uh, as, as I said, the shortest road. It's only 11,000 kilometers. You know that the most connection with Europe and Asia takes place through submarine cables. We believe that if the cable laid, it will connect uh, enrich the region, it will create new workforces there. And uh, as I said in, at the beginning of my speech, um, it, it was just idea of TASIM that we wanted to make a transit road. We wanted to just transit traffic. 
Uh, but when we started to work with World Bank, when we started to work with ESCA, when we started to work with uh, World Economic Forum, the colleagues and friends, they started to come with ideas, and they started to pump us with ideas, and it was a great to see how the again, project transformed. So, uh, the, uh, for example, the World Bank, the mission came to Azerbaijan, and they said, that's a good idea, but you shouldn't forget about Northern Africa. Northern Africa is developing very much, and it can be a great road to connect Northern Africa with Central Asia through the, uh, the Tysim project. Then they said, even more, they said that we have doing a research on Central Asia. Do you have an idea what's developing in Central Asia in terms of their capacities, demand for the uh, internet? Well, we said, you know, we have some idea, but it's not clear. We said, okay, we have this kind of research. Let's collaborate. Let's include Azerbaijan. And let's make it bigger and see how TASIM exactly map, what the technical uh, capacities we need for TASIM. So, through this way, we started to work with World Bank. So we started, then we started to work with ASCAP, and ASCAP told us that TASIM should be also an extension of Asian superhighway. So we also, I mean, we had no, <laughs> pretty much so much idea. Was we, we always wanted to reach China. That was our ultimate goal. Now we're talking about reaching out Afghanistan. Now we're talking about reaching about Mongolia, because double length load country, Mongolia is in the radar, is the World Bank too. So this, this kind of collaboration, once again, uh, we, we, we extremely enjoyed it. We were so excited that <laughs> this small project started to shape, reshape itself and uh, uh, come to this level. And, uh, and at the regarding cybersecurity conference, which Thomas mentioned, in this December, in the 2nd of December, we're going to have this conference. So we will be more than happy to see you all in this conference. So welcome to Baku. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhao, Hazanov. Uh, I would like to now give the floor to Mr. Jo uh, Yanta Fernando from Sri Lanka, so Director and Legal Advisor of ICT Agency of Sri Lanka. Welcome. So you have 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, David. Uh, and uh, thanks to the World Bank Group for organizing this very uh, significant and important session. Uh, the role of multilateral <coughs> uh, organizations in cybersecurity. So uh, I commend the World Bank and all the agencies that have come together in this uh, harmonized exercise, uh, which uh, I hope will result in a greater collaboration uh, uh, between multilaterals and between clients uh, of uh, multilateral agencies uh, that that are represented here. So, uh, well, getting into the topic, uh, we know that many countries are at presently developing uh, national level ICT strategies and programs to facilitate growth, to reduce poverty, and transform their economies to more technology based or knowledge based economies. So, in the area of ICT for development, uh, in formulating ICT development strategies, multilateral agencies, especially the World Bank and uh, Inter-American Bank and uh, European Development Bank and all other agencies can play a pivotal role. Often, we have seen that ICT development strategies funded by governments with or without support from multilateral agencies do not address the challenges surrounding cybersecurity. However, if these ICT-related investments are to be effective and reach their intended development objective, it is essential that all national ICT strategies include a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy. And I think our friend from the World Economic Forum brought out the point of how uh, uh, this subject of cybersecurity and the need for comprehensive strategies associated with it are not significantly well known amongst the leaders who drive ICT programs at a national level. So in this context, I have a couple of points which I would like to speak on. Firstly, the need, of, the need for ICT strategies to include cybersecurity strategies and the role of multilateral organizations using my country as an uh, example. What are the challenges 
and needs of developing countries, and how can multilateral agencies match those needs? What cooperation opportunities can be employed to further this overall objective? Often, the subject of cybersecurity is overlooked in many uh, ICT strategies, and it is essential, and the single most important message I would like to give is that countries must adopt national level information security strategies in all its ICT development agendas if they want to better realize their development goal and make their investments worthy. Uh, Mr. Chris Wayne, uh, earlier in the presentation, mentioned about the total ICT investments made by World Bank over a period of time, which is significant. Uh, in a stock uh, taking exercise, I think what might be worthwhile for us to do is to figure out what percent of that investment was used for developing and implementing information security strategies? Because often we have seen in the developing world and uh, emerging countries, ICT development initiatives are undertaken, and there's hardly any allocation for the formulation and implementation of ICT strategies. Our experience in this area is associated largely with the E-Sri Lanka Development Initiative, uh, better known as the E-Lanka Initiative that uh, uh, Chris's team, together with uh, other divisions of the World Bank, are involved with. Uh, quite a significant amount of investment has been made. Uh, uh, by the end of the project uh, that is happening uh, uh, December 2013, uh, over, from 2005 to December 2013, the total investment from the World Bank lending arm would constitute exactly US dollars 55 million. <coughs> Origi originally, our ICT strategies under Sri Lanka did not include a cybersecurity component. There was a component known as the e loss component to develop policies and strategies to facilitate growth and ICT development through legislation such as electronic transactions law, legal reform, and IPR reform. However, over time, the e-laws component was adapted to include the formulation of cybercrime legislation based on international best practices, as well as the development of cybersecurity strategies and implementing them. The change and the adaptation was possible thanks largely to the flexibility of the World Bank team who partnered with us at that time, and we commend them for that. But we also face significant challenges then, because certain arms of the multilateral agencies thought this was not important. As clients, we are now pleased to say that tremendous progress is visible on the ground by multilateral agencies like the World Bank Group in this area. The cybersecurity strategies adopted included the creation of a high-level information security policy, the HIPOL, as part of the overall e-government policy uh, uh, adopted by the Cabinet of Ministers in December 2009. And along with that, the multi-pronged initiative included the creation of an institutional framework known as the Sri Lanka CERT, uh, 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 which started operations in August 2006. So uh, I have explained a lot about Sri Lanka CERT and what it has been able to do in the case study, which I believe uh, Natalija will be publishing uh, online. And you can take a look at that, the operational framework, the governance model. It, it's, it's a very small team of nine people uh, doing a coordinated exercise with multiple agencies uh, across government, across banks, across civil society groups. Uh, to give you a quick a glimpse of where it has uh, moved from then to now, uh, originally, 2007-2008, less than 50 uh, incidents were reported. Number one, because the community out there were not comfortable in reporting incidents. And people were not aware of what incidents really affected them. Many of them would not know that their computers are affected by botnets and so on and so forth. But as of 2012, we have 1,840 incidents reported compared to 1,469 reported in 2011. So a 25% increase from 2011 to 2012, all swamp, swamping the work of Sri Lanka CERT. 
So on an average, uh, uh, on a monthly basis, there are over 200 Facebook complaints, uh, email uh, hijacking uh, uh, scenarios, and so on and so forth. And CERT, has a, uh, together with ICT, has embarked on uh, uh, sector-wide C-CERTs so that those sectors will take care of their own cybersecurity issues. So the bank CSERT is an in initiative that I have explained in the note that will be presented as a case study. In the area of training and awareness, they have hosted what is known as the annual cybersecurity week, uh, 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 combining a hacking challenge, a national and an international level congress, as well as a quiz to educate the public at a school level the significance of information security, uh, etc. So, in conclusion, I have just a couple of points I just want to highlight. What are the emerging cybersecurity challenges and needs of developing countries? Well, development of comprehensive uh, uh, information security strategies is paramount. And not only that, implementing them, partnering uh, clients in implementing them and hand-holding them in the creation of institutional models is essential. And uh, what are the challenges that we face? Well, the biggest challenge I would see is transitioning a project from one to another and creating a sustainable arrangement before funding is scaled down. And I think this is one area that we need to have a, a significant level of discussion. And in conclusion, I would also urge the multilateral agencies to ensure that there is intra-donor coordination. So, for example, we see in Sri Lanka there are multiple lending agencies doing ICT-related projects done in silos, and they don't connect up with the ICT development strategies that we have included, and they do not include the information security policies that have been uh, invested upon through uh, other lending agencies. And then we saw, for example, our friend from ITU ex explained about the study in Bhutan, and I think uh, what was lacking, I think, in that uh, case is that uh, Sri Lanka CERT has emerged as the first in South Asia to become part of the global first community and hosted the AP CERT. But they have not been included in the World Bank ITU-driven project in sharing our uh, challenges and know-how in Bhutan. So I think what we can do is ensuring coordination between clients, coordination between multilateral agencies, and with that, I conclude my submission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fernando. Uh, as Mr. Sharif Hashem is not with us, so Mr. David can... can... Thank you very much. Um, our friend uh, Dr. Sharif Hashem from Egypt couldn't make it here today um, at the last moment, um, but he did provide us with a very uh, comprehensive case study, and I'll uh, present some of the highlights of that. Um, I'd also, in the context of this uh, presentation on behalf of Egypt, um, I would uh, take the opportunity to emphasize, uh, as Chris mentioned earlier today, um, some of the work that's reflected in uh, Egypt's case study was the result of uh, work that was done in collaboration with the World Bank and others. The financing instrument that was used in that case uh, was not a loan or a grant, it was called Reimbursable Advisory Services, uh, which is one of among many of the financing instruments that Chris mentioned this morning um, in which we can engage with our clients. Um, I'll roughly, I'll very uh, quickly go through uh, the main headings of Dr. Hashem's report. Um, as a lawyer, I'm delighted that he started with the legal enabling environment. Um, and having worked with, uh, with uh, Sharif and other counterparts in Egypt, I know they put a lot of time and energy into getting the enabling environment right up front. Uh, at the same time, they rolled out a digital identity management system using PKI, a uh, huge undertaking, 80 million plus uh, Egyptian citizens who are being um, introduced to uh, state-of-the-art, very secure, uh, authentication systems. Egypt has a CERT, has many CERTs. It's also a member of FIRST, as um, Jay was saying. Um, I don't know if he would highlight this, but I will highlight the, the efforts at capacity building that Egypt has undertaken. 
um, sometimes using uh, donor assistance, sometimes not, uh, but a, a huge focus on educating the citizenry uh, to ensure that at, at every level, in government, in industry, and in civil society, uh, that the dialogue can happen at the same level. So there's been a, a, a great amount of attention paid to capacity building. Um, he does end up um, going briefly over uh, different aspects of international cooperation. One of them that I'll highlight on his behalf uh, was an effort being done uh, with ITU, which is the, um, the working group for child online protection. Uh, Egypt is um, chairing that group uh, within ITU, and uh, it's a very, very important work in this area. So with that, um, I'll conclude and thank Sharif for providing us with this case study. Thank you, David. I think we, we will come back to it later with some questions regarding that. But uh, before uh, we, I give the floor to a question from the attendants, attendees, I will uh, give, ask Mr. My friend, Izumi. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, microphone, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm asking the question, like you as well, perhaps, why am I here? <laughs> uh, maybe I'm the one only civil society member on the panel, just to put this panel or workshop as a multi-stakeholder. Most of them are government and intergovernmental organizations. Of course, that's logical because the title of this workshop is the role of the multilateral um, organizations under the multi-stakeholder IGF. This is only one who focuses on the multilateral, which is fine. Um, actually, I've been working on several aspects of the information security areas, and uh, I'm head heading a small research institute in one of the prefectures called Oita, which is a population of 1.2 million people. Uh, it's, uh, it represents only 1% of the economy of Japan. Um, and the challenge is in this small local um, prefecture and city uh, often are similar to what the developing countries as an entire nation are facing sometimes. We don't get that much support from the central government, a little bit from the local government. Um, this year, my colleague, a lady, um, just received an Asian Information Security Award for the, some of the practitioners. As a practitioner, we are visiting more than 100 schools um, in our region or prefecture almost every week or two per week and giving all the, you know, what to do with when you get some silly email from an adult or, or your, on your mobile or you're seduced as a schoolgirl. We have given these lectures to more than 40,000 kids a year, um, really on the ground. And we also have some um, hot, hotline, uh, telephone and email of any kind of problems they face as a citizens, and we work with law enforcement or schools or any other parties as a multi-stakeholder. Um, and these kind of activities, not only on the top you know, government policy level, but as you mentioned, implementation level is essential. Because these days, you, everybody has the internet. You can either attack or receive attacks anytime. Um, I also did some policy study over the information security policy between 2003 and 2005, 10 years ago, and lost funding, so I couldn't continue the study. However, um, that time we saw very much lack of global cooperation framework on cybersecurity. So I'm pleased to hear that finally the UN is now having this framework, whether it's really implementable and uh, down on the ground, again, is yet another question. Uh, I was invited at the CIS Commission on Information Security workshop, uh, I mean meeting in Astana, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, five years ago as a, one of the policy studies experts. And that former Soviet CIS country is one of the few um, bodies which have very um, serious governmental or intergovernmental cooperation on information security areas. Um, there's one in, in, in Europe called ENISA. Um, the, and we heard all about the OECD, ITU. There's some work ongoing in APEC and the World Bank groups. But um, maybe my question or my role is to uh, ask some question about the roles of the multilaterals and the multi-stakeholder together. I think it's not the either or question. 
But there are certain areas where the multilaterals are very good at. When it comes to national security or cyber war, it really requires intergovernmental cooperation. When the attack happened in Estonia, I heard, in, I went there later, that they communicated with the Russian government. And they, the Russian government said, how you define this? Is it a war? Or it's just in, you know, private sectors or citizens' actions. We don't know. And there were no agreed upon international definition of the cyber war at that time or even after. So for some people, it's a war. doesn't mean it's real war. So how do you define it on an international level? Um, of course, we always need for technical and business expertise. The most bureaucrats don't have, or used, at least in the past. Um, for the critical infrastructure protection, these are mainly operated by the private companies in, in certain countries. In certain countries, it's still national. But, that's what, but it's also it's a public good or public resources that requires heavy amount of governmental interventions. But computer security requires, as I mentioned, the user-citizen involvement in many ways. Um, I believe ENISA has in their advisory board, or no, their board, they have representatives from the civil society or the users, just one person, um, out, and all the others are mostly the, the state representatives. But um, I was told that we really need the citizens to be involved in this game. Uh, human rights and privacy concerns, I, I don't have to mention that much, but uh, well, oh, uh, many of our civil society groups are very concerned about these acts, and we We'd like to be involved. Um, in this um, panel, I think the focus is for the development or developing countries. And of course, the capacity building uh, is essential. And you mentioned about certs. This is the uh, picture of the certs today. I just downloaded it a few hours ago. It's about 61 countries. They have uh, 283 certs or C certs as a member of the first. That's the only global body, uh, operational, so to speak. And if you zoom in, these white areas where there are no certs as a member of the first, so big hole in Africa, and many in the Central and Middle East, um, uh, Central and Middle East Asians, as well as some Southeast Asians. Um, so I hope that more efforts to be done I don't know why Italy is not a member of, <laughs> or some other European countries. But anyway, um, so these are the areas that we perhaps expect multilaterals to really help. Uh, by the way, around the first, as a global one, there are only two regional entities. One is TSC CERT in Europe, uh, is a regional coordination of the CERTs, and AP CERT in Asia Pacific. Um, so the rest of the regions, they don't have these frameworks either. Um, so there's, uh, to me, there's a lot to do, and I would like to leave the last words as multi-stakeholder um, on top of the multilateral. I hope you guys will create something a little bit more uh, to the reaching out to people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Izumi. Very good, very good co-presentation. Co uh, yes, as, as we see, there is a lot of gaps and there is a lot of capacity building required and a lot of things need to be done. And that's, I think this is one of the, our objectives. Uh, I turn to the attendees. Do you have any questions to our panelists, and including me, of course? <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Hei Won, and I'm from Korea Internet and Security Agency. I first would like to thank you all for um, insightful remarks. Um, I attended the Seoul um, Conference on Cyberspace, and I was part of the capacity building agenda. And one of the things that was in emphasized um, in the panel was that um, uh, discovering best practices for developing countries is important. However, we have to focus more on um, finding the appropriate practices for each country or the region. And I want to know how multilateral organizations are working on um, how to uh, formulating um, tailor-made um, projects, um, in particular in the cybersecurity capacity, capacity building projects. So, um Want to take? Can you answer? Yeah. 
about capacity for the US. Um, I, th I think this probably goes back a little bit to the first panel, so if there are any other members from the first panel who want to chime in on this, let, let us know. Um, representing a, a multilateral development bank, I'll take a crack at answering your question. While I agree with you uh, that there aren't any cookie cutter approaches to this, um, and uh, speaking on behalf of my own institution, we, we do very much attempt to, to tailor our projects to the needs of the, the countries with whom we're engaged. At the same time, there are some basic principles that need to be adhered to. And sometimes these principles evolve. So um, Alan this morning mentioned this principle of resilience as opposed to walled security. Um, that's a very important principle, but that's evolved over time. When we started in this game in the mid-90s, it was about security, it wasn't about resilience. Moez made a very important point about the safeguards and human rights attendant to cybersecurity and achieving a balance between protecting cyberspace, as that might be defined in a country, and protecting citizens' rights and their security. These, these are very difficult questions. Um, we're dealing uh, internationally uh, across cultures, across legal systems, across languages, uh, uh, with the introduction of different scripts now on the internet. We're, you know, we're dealing with a lot of different variable factors that need to be taken into account. So I, I take the point, um, and I do think that there is being uh, there is an effort being made to address the individual needs of countries while at the same time ensuring that these kind of internationally accepted norms are respected. Yeah, um, if I may add to what uh, David said in response to that question, I fully agree uh, with David. Our experience in this area has shown that over time, since 2005, <coughs> there was a significant partnership developed uh, along with multilateral agencies like World Bank and uh, government as the primary client, which resulted in an extremely well-structured, tailor-made program to suit our needs. So there was significant attention done, and one good thing in engaging a multilateral in a partnering with an ICT development strategy is that there is an opportunity at that point to bring in international best practices. So I just want to give two examples that might be relevant and also might even address a point uh, that Izu, uh, Izumi, my friend Izumi from the ICANN multi-stakeholder model raised the role of multi-stakeholders themselves uh, partnering in this exercise. Well, uh, one uh, example that I would like to cite is that in developing our national cyber crime law, the computer crimes law, which originated from a discussion draft in 2001. Uh, it was a complete uh, national-driven framework with using UK and Singapore as best practice examples. But when that was brought into the fold of the e-Sri Lanka strategy, uh, what we were able to do is make use of the best practices to include the checks and balances that are needed in investigation and prosecution area based on the human rights guidelines found in the Budapest Convention. So that was an example of a best practice that was used. Of course, we did use the ITU toolkit as a uh, necessary guide. We were uh, involved in co-authoring some parts of the ITU toolkit with the uh, uh, American Bar Association. So that was also very useful. Second point on the role of multi-stakeholders uh, that I want to highlight is that uh, one experience that I can share is that when we started both our ICTA, uh, the national agency, under which the Sri Lanka CERT became a subsidiary company, and why a company? To make it a flexible model to hire people at private sector kind of remuneration rates. That became a big challenge at one point, but we managed to overcome that. But at, uh, in the early days, what we found is this, the composition of the board was the problem. We had an entirely uh, government-oriented board at the beginning, but since 2008, 
and mid-2009, the board was restructured to include the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, and now we have, in the, both in the CERT board and the ICTA board, uh, uh, communities representing the private sector and civil society groups. And that completely resulted in a paradigm shift in the implementation activities that were uh, undertaken both by ICT and CERT. With this, I will I'll just comment that uh, for CERT, of course, there is a lot of all, all the CERT in the developing world, I think, they are a uh, governmental CERT. But maybe owing to the what said Mr. Uzumi from uh, a MAG member, it is now important for us to consider also having a community based CERT that could be really very. Uh, important work with the, with for national security implementation. There are really a lot of today a lot of young generation that are willing to to be part of this national security ag agency or, or, or build what we call uh, a community based search. And this is very very uh, innovate, innovative in our in our developing world. And we could it, it could be really uh, another response to also the, the to, to the um, uh, the question that have been high highlighted. For so. Do you have other qu other questions to the panelists? Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah, so a comment. Microphone, please. Thank you very much. Just adding to the, the same question, if I may, because uh, uh, there was and as uh, using using the like uh, David's. David's invitation to add some for some people from the previous panel. I think for us at least, one one important principle is that it's not from us to you in terms of a developing country support. It's develop so these are countries helping each other, and that's for ITU is a very important principle because we are member member states driven organizations. So we're not consider that secretariat is providing support to the members, but members are providing support to themselves in a collaboration, and that's where I think there was already a very good example mentioned from Sri Lanka when collaborating in designing the toolkit. It's not like a toolkit designed by experts and then, then imposing the countries, but countries involved in that. And also some of the projects that we uh, helped implement for the European Commission. So, uh, so in Saharan Africa and the Caribbean and Pacific, we're not experts going and teaching people, but we're with expert support countries designing the frameworks that then would be we would help implement. So that's, I think, the very important principle that overcomes a bit of that cut cut approach or, you know, trying to implement that. But uh, that is just a facilitated work by the countries themselves and then on their own. And they decide, deciding the priorities and also they deciding whether there's the best solution where necessary bringing the there. Thank you. Thank you for the good comment. Uh, question by here? The lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last one. Thank you, and thank you for an interesting panel. Um, my question or comment is more about the human rights part of the whole cybersecurity and cooperation. Um, whether the um, there, there's going to be some kind of um, monitoring mechanism that will hold some of the governments who are part to this um, convention um, uh, that actually violate uh, human rights or freedom of expression by um, arresting uh, activists who you know, are express expressing or practicing their freedom of expression online um, under this um, overall convention of you know, protecting um, rights of people and et cetera. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. I think we have highlighted a lot of times uh, the importance of human rights and privacy to ensure the national security. And uh, it's not just a matter of um, having people in jail or something like that. Because, you know, for example, when a hacker yesterday, for example, in Tunisia, we have Op Tunisia again, you know. We had a Op Tunisia before the revolution on the 3rd of January 2011. And yesterday we had an Op Tunisia again, and hackers attacked a lot of sites and in my data centers in Tunisia. 
what we can say about it, it's just when we deal with these operations that come from anonymous people and so on, we need to be careful because they are a young generation can be involved in this operation and they are innovative people that could be really, really worthy for the economy. What we need is capacity building. It has been highlighted by in the Egypt case study. It's very important to, to, to educate those people, to, to try to train them, to avoid having involving them in some political things that could be really harm them in terms of their freedom of expression. This is very important, but that need, we need to be considered differently in, diff in developing world because we are not in the same situation as in different uh, uh, places. But uh, there are a lot of things to be done in this field. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, it's me. Um, I agree with you, but then also I'd like to highlight that human rights have different dimensions. Um, maybe it relates to what you s said about the development of the economy as well. In Korea or in Japan, the, the youngsters are very much annoyed by or abused or they're abusing their experiences with games, especially in Korea and getting there and uh, being exploited commercially. The, many children are playing the game over the mobile or smartphones and they're they are almost forced to buy spend money on some gadgets and it's becoming a big problem so it's a sort of the um, human rights violation from the commercial sectors to the public a lot of defamation are happening using all the SNSs and sometimes people kill themselves or you know it's it's different dimensions and it also requires a huge uh, education um, on top of the political you know rights or free speeches and which are very important but um, this um, the cyber security or the deployment of the, the internet to everyone is creating wider social problems uh, which we also need to address thank you to me by this i think we can have one minute come uh, conclu to conclude the panel I think what has been highlighted is very, very important today. It's something that we could really agree. We need to collaborate. We need to be a partner of multilateral and multi-stakeholder approaches for different reasons because we, today is a lot of critical issues that we need to address very quick in, my, in a developing world. Uh, so, I could... Yeah, so in conclusion, yeah, this is an ex extremely good panel. And uh, whilst thanking the World Bank, well, my parting message, two parting messages, uh, for any developing country to come up to speed in the area of uh, cybersecurity strategies or ICT strategies, they have to necessarily engage multilateral agencies. So that's a necessary fact. And the resulting benefit will not only be to your country, but can percolate down to the region as well. So for example, Sri Lanka, we held a lot of capacity building activities but in those activities, we also included uh, delegations from Maldives. Finally, a lot of patience is needed from both sides. Multilateral agencies have to be patient with their clients and have a hand-holding process and not drop them like a hot brick uh, once a project is over, it's gone, and then uh, allowing the client to run with it. And maybe there should be a transition phase. But more importantly, the clients themselves have to be patient with the multilateral agencies and understand the dynamics under which they work. And if you engage them from a proper dynamic uh, kind of a, uh, understanding based perspective, you can get your thing done. Thank you. Thanks. I uh, felt a bit alien today because my subject is not very much in the cybersecurity, but uh, the project itself, the TASIM itself, I think that great result, that what we have today is a great result of the collaboration which we enjoy in Azerbaijan. And I told you how it's transformed from a simple idea to something very practical. And this December, when you will be in Baku, we're also going to sign a, uh, one document. I cannot really what kind of document is that, but we're going to sign a document which is going to be a, another milestone in the development of um, TASIM project. And we think that even after we signed this project, which uh, formally kicked off the construction of the TASI project, uh, still we're going to engage with uh, international institutions, with ITU, with the World Bank. And I'm also planning to go to Kenya. There is going to be conference on landlocked countries. I think that I'm also going to grab something. So every single meeting, every single collaboration, every single uh, expertise with you guys enrich us. So, and I'm happy uh, in this regard that we have you, you all. I want to thank you all. Without you all, my project would be something very, very different. Thanks a lot.
Thank you. Um, I just want to put one line or two. Um, in order to enhance the real multilateral cooperation internationally, I think there's a huge need to enhance the multi-stakeholder cooperation at the national, local level. And that's sort of, it's not the either or case again, I said. Uh, the true multilateral in, involves, I think, not the government per each country, but the citizens and the private sectors all together. And the government is a good conduit to the international cooperation. With, that's my hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. And by this, I think we can, we can close now.